everyone. It is my pleasure to invite you to another episode of the Big Picture series of conversations sponsored by Iron Pillar, where we talk to our entrepreneurs and also members of the broader Iron Pillar Network family. Uh, in that context, it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce my dear friend and a, and a wonderful IPN member, a prolific technologist, uh, Mr. Talal Shamoon. And Talal, welcome to the show. Hey, MJ, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I would love to start off by just uh, having you take us through your remarkable journey. Uh, and you can start wherever you'd like, uh, but uh, but I think it, the audience is going to love it. So please. So I'm, I'm a funny bird as far as they go. I'm not the kind of drop out of college, go to Silicon Valley um, sort of stereotype that everybody hears about. I, I actually always had the sort of dual personality um, going through education. And, you know, part of me really sort of loved science and wanted to be a researcher and an academic. But the other part of me was, um, you know, somebody who loved to build things and make things. And you know, so I wanted to start my own company and be an entrepreneur. So, um, you know, being someone who always likes to have their cake and eat it, what I, what I realized was, well, if I stay in the academic system, I get a PhD and become a researcher, maybe I can get an academic position, a professorship at a really good university, in which case, you know, you look at what happened at Stanford and all these great schools where, you know, people teach, they do research, they have ideas, they make companies, next thing you know, you get Google. And so I was kind of tracking down that path. Um, I got a PhD at Cornell in electrical engineering. My, my, my PhD was in signal processing and information theory, actually. I got a postdoc um, when I finished my PhD at a really interesting lab um, in Princeton, New Jersey, right on the edge of campus that was funded by the Japanese company NEC. This is back in the mid nineties when the Japanese semiconductor companies were just like dominating the planet, making money hand over fist. And, and they were starting to invest cash in science and R and D in a really, really aggressive way, which was awesome. So this place was a country club research lab, if you will, where people were just funded to think. It was, it was a scientist's dream come true. So I was lucky I, I got a job there. And within a few weeks of signing up, serendipity hit. And I ended up um, stumbling into an idea with a group of researchers. Um, there were three of us at NEC Princeton and a guy at MIT called Tom Layton, who was a very famous professor, by the way, went on to found Akamai. Sure. Um, and th this was classic science serendipity. I, I had been thinking through ways of hiding messages inside pictures and or sounds or videos, and I had figured out the signal processing. Um, there was a guy at NEC called Joe Killian, who was a brilliant uh, computational complexity guy, but sort of dabbled a lot in cryptography. And he had been talking to Tom about designing uh, signal patterns that were very resilient to a certain kind of attack called a collusion attack. And there was another guy at NEC who was sort of one of the more established image processing folks there called Ingemar Cox, who, who drew me out and got us all together. And we came out with what became the, the NEC spread spectrum watermarking algorithm, which is how I ended up in computer security. Two things happened that sort of led me down this path. One was, um, there was this reporter showed up at the lab who was writing, you know, one of these cool science reporters. She was in the New York Times. And they wrote a story about this thing we had invented, which was very romantic. You know, you have an image and there's a hidden message inside it. But you can't right. see it, but you can't take it out. And a few weeks later, the receptionist forwards a phone call to my desk. And I, you know, it was the old, you know, telephone with a cord on it. And I go, yeah, can I help you? And there's a, it was a photographer from Florida, 1996. The web was happening. Yahoo was out there. Amazon was out there. That was, that was it. Right. And Netscape. Right. And or, you know, and the, and the guy goes, hey, I, I read this thing in the newspaper. I, can, can I buy your software? And I go, we don't sell software. You know, what are you talking about? He goes, uh, well, I, 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 I'm a photographer. I take pictures and I put them on the Internet. Can I, can, can I buy your software to protect my pictures? Because people steal them. And I go, I, I'd, I'd love to help you. All I can do is I can send you a research paper and some MATLAB code. And you can write your own program. And the guy was like, dude, I'm a photographer, you know, click. <laughs> and I just got to thinking, I'm like, wow, we can sell this stuff. Now, the other thing that happened around the same time was 
they brought it as FedEx. They put it on my desk. I open it. And it's a letter from another company in the space from their lawyers going, we read your paper and blah, blah, blah. You're infringing the following patents, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, ah! it was kind of, I mean, I, I had invented stuff before and so on and so forth, but I was a scientist who wrote it up, put it in the, in the literature and just went on your, you know, you know the, the, the food pellets came through a different motivation source. Hmm. And so I walked over to the lawyer, he's a very nice guy. And I, I was kind of scared and I showed him this thing and he, he laughed and he just threw it on a stack of, of papers behind him. He went, ah, don't worry, kid, we get one of these a day. And I, that's sort of what started to thread this whole thing. Anyway, very long story short, no one wanted to build a product around this or we had a rotten attitude, take your pick. So we ended up deciding that we were going to leave, we being my, my, the team I was working with closely and, and, and me, and start a company mm. doing digital watermarking. And in that process, we met the founder of Intertrust, who was just this larger than life, visionary, brilliant entrepreneur. And he was sort of the bridge I walked across to leave the science world and really enter the entrepreneurship world. Victor, the founder of Intertrust, I, I thought had really gotten it right. I mean, he had remarkable respect and commitment to the development of intellectual property. Um, he was a brilliant fundraiser and just uh, like just probably the best evangelist I've ever met. And and an amazing, and it just he just. He was a serial entrepreneur. He's never worked for anyone in his life. All he did was start companies. Uh, but he was he was brilliant, self-taught, you know, in, in, in the whole area. Victor's dad, uh, who had passed a long time before, was one of the co-inventors of chemotherapy, actually, and had come wow. from this, this family that was like deep into changing the world. And the mission of Intertrust was all about transformation of human society. Victor was actually a sociologist. So for me, it checked a whole bunch of boxes. And, you know, the message to young entrepreneurs out there is you don't have to react to whatever the fashion out there is. I mean, if you've got an idea and you've got a vision with enough patience and a lot of luck, you can often find a happy medium to, to, to operate from, to really like take your ideas and your concepts to market on your terms. And that's really important. And that's, you know, that's really what took me in. I, I, I felt I could maintain my commitment to sort of deep thought and long view um, and create capital gain at the same time. So we're like, goodbye, Princeton, one-way ticket out here. And I've been here since 1997, so I lost count. In the course of building that company out, he realized several things. One was Distributed computing was going to happen in a fashion that was far more atomic, if you will, than people ever thought, right? So tremendous efficiency from distributed computing, you need several things for distributed computing to happen. One was you needed better and better microprocessors to make smaller and smaller hardware. Storage becomes an issue. Uh, but if you have a very fast, reliable network that interconnects all these atomic computers everywhere, then bingo, you've got distributed computing. So what Victor noticed was, oh, mainframe, mini, PC. And then he went, what happens next? Oh, DVD player, CD, mobile phone, blah, 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 blah. light bulbs, you know, cars, you know. So he said, well, wait a minute. The classic security model is to lock the machine in a room and shoot the bad guys when they go near it. Right. Well, that's not going to happen when the thing's in your pocket. And look at the music industry, right? You've got, you know, you got a music app on your phone. You're either buying the stuff or stealing it. The thing's in someone's pocket. They don't know. So he basically said, okay, you can't rely on old school security techniques, including, by the way, it's not just soldiers with guns. It's firewalls. Traditional security is about insides and outsides. And economies are not. Economies are about trade. They're about exchange. And he basically came up with a way of rewriting the operating system to have a secure execution environment that data and software could check into. And you can have digital rules applied to that in that secure environment and everything that touched it was authenticated. The, the, that's the original thing. And he founded the company in 1990. He worked in complete secrecy from 90 to 95 because going back to the entrepreneurs, de-risking markets and, and things like that, he basically realized this is very prophetic and this is going to be very big. That's amazing. By the way, one thing that you just sort of glance right over, and I think there should be a building named after you at Cornell and Ithaca, is that you have 
a bachelor's, master's, and a PhD uh, from Cornell. So, 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 congrats on on that level of sort of um, you know intellectual capacity to 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 be both a researcher, by the way, uh, as well as uh, call it a, a practicing entrepreneur or or a business person. Often, it's it's difficult to find both in ample. Uh, quantity and quality, and I think um, uh, you have both in uh, in abundance. So, uh, so, so, congrats on all that. One of my heroes is Erwin Jacobs, who's the founder of Qualcomm, and I mean, he happened to be a Cornell undergraduate. I mean, he, he got his PhD at MIT, but he, you know, there are a lot of people who go down the path of sort of academics and then entrepreneurship and invention, and it 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 depends on the niche. But it 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 can it works remarkably well. And if you look at a lot of the really solid, you know, sort of infrastructure companies that have lasted, like it, it, they're really ones that are built on a very very solid bedrock of 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 research and, and intellectual property. I mean, Qualcomm is 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 the is the uh, is the you know cathedral on the hill, so to speak. Of one of the things that intrigues me about what you guys are doing, India, of course, is by far one of the most, if not the most innovative marketplaces in the world, it's done it with a very interesting relationship with patents. There are niches of Indian industry that are very solid with respect to intellectual property. And biotech and, and pharmaceuticals are, is, is a very good example of that. In IT, it's a very different story. Um, as, as Indian ventures start to globalize, I, I think you'll start seeing them play a really, really interesting role in the in that weird intellectual property foundation that sort of underpins all good ideas. But um, mm. one I mean, one of the things I'm I'm really interested in is is working with some of your portfolio companies and sort of helping them strategize that way. Yeah, I know it's interesting you you bring that up. Obviously, you've been very very deep uh, in the entire sort of IP domain, if you will, for for decades, and often in the in the VC parlance, right? We we talk or we tend to talk more about execution and execution capability, and it's more about you know execution than it is potentially about uh, uh, IP in terms of any sort of deep tech. One certain Mr. Larry Ellison found out from the Supreme Court last week that um, his claims against Google weren't as robust as they were. I'm not sure I agree with that ruling, but it is what it is. APIs right now are very hard to protect. A certain Mr. Stephen P. Jobs in the 1980s found out that uh, user interfaces aren't as easy to defend as he thought they were. Thank you, Windows 95 or Windows whatever it was. Um, right. The it there's an art to it. It's not hyper sophisticated, uh, but it, it there, you know, it's a it's a strategic weapon just like anything else, and, and people really need to think through it. Very interesting. From there, we decided. You know, I decided with with the board, the, the owners, my team, that we should try to sort of build a Qualcomm for trust, and so we we built a very successful to, today continues licensing program. And we also started building products. And we went back to our roots in media DRM, working with consumer electronics companies, we created an open standard uh, for video protection. It's, it's used all over the world now. Um, and we built product on top of it. And as, as the rest of the internet caught up, this idea that data needed to be governed as it traveled through distributed systems is now everywhere. Right. So about four or five years ago, we decided to start growing out of the media market into other markets. And again, through serendipity and coincidence, we ended up becoming friends with some major energy companies. And uh, I, I had this one of those light bulb moments where I was like, hang on a minute, several things are going on. One, if we can get into the energy business, everything I care about uses electrons. So I just follow the electrons. Two, right. having studied quantum mechanics once upon a lifetime, you know, it was kind of this cutesy uh, idea that every electron had in a bit, a one or a zero associated with it. Um, and I was like, wait a minute, the you know future energy grids and future energy systems are all going to be data driven. And then really the, 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 the Marlon Brando line in Apocalypse Now, it hit me like a diamond bullet to the forehead. What I saw happening in energy was exactly what happened in music. In music, they, their entire business was protected by the fact that to steal music at the shoplift, the CD at Tower Records. Right. 
what happened? You took the CD, you put it in a computer, you made an MP3, you hung it off your computer with Napster. The entire protection on the value chain went away. MP3, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, and um, just broadband. Killed the music business. Now they're reincarnated, thanks to us. Merry Christmas. Um, what's happening in energy? Deregulation, renewable energy, and uh, IoT. Same story. If you and I wanted to start an energy company in 1985, we would have to go down the street, buy some plutonium, go back, build a nuclear reactor, put up some power lines. Not the kind of thing that guys like us can do very easily. Today, I always joke that Tesla is not a car company. Right. Tesla is an energy company that has mobile storage batteries as one of their products. Why do you think he's in solar and Bitcoin? He's going to create a universal value exchange system based on knowing who needs an electron when and um, allowing you to trade. You know, he'll know that my car goes home every day with an average of 37% in the battery. So right. when I'm parked in front of the Intertrust building, he'll just sell that 37% back to Intertrust for me and give me a piece of it because he'll know I'll get home. And um, interesting. So yeah. I, I just said, wow, energy companies are gonna lose, they're gonna lose their entire grip on their value chain because the, the thing that, protected them was regulation and the complexity of centralized generation. And that's gone because with solar and with wind, you have what's called, they're called, it's got a word now, it's called distributed energy resources. So I was like, data-driven energy, that's a big thing. So we, we started building out. So that's one market we're in, follow the electrons. We're talking to car companies. Um, obviously entertainment media is near and dear to our hearts. The internet has created additional markets for rights management in the back end. How does an artist know how many times Spotify played their music or how many times, right. Right. How many times did Netflix show ET? You know, it's like, you got to trust Netflix, you know? So, you know, good luck trusting the people in between you and your customer, right? Or your consumer, right? So um, yeah, we've, I mean, it's been this, amazingly enough, it's been the same theme throughout. It's just the theme and the idea was so big in the beginning and so comprehensive. The biggest challenge we've always had is just execution. You know, and like with any innovative company, do too much, pull back, do too little, grow, do too much, yep. pull back. And fortunately, it's been a zigzag that's, you know, in, you know, increase the curve keeps going up, you know, with, with the odd zig and the odd zag. But I mean, people always look at me and go, you've been at the same company for 25 years. What's wrong with you? It's Silicon Valley. <laughs> and I, depending on my mood, I've got two answers to that. One is it hasn't been the same company. It's just right. constantly evolving. Um, the other answer is it's just, it's been fun. So why leave? Why do something different? Um, and there's an article in the New York Times in 2003, Steve Lohr wrote a story and the headline was great. It was as Silicon Valley reboots the geeks takeover. And it was, huh. there were three companies in there, uh, VMware, Intertrust, and I think the third was Tell Me, one of the, the voice, voice, voice IP companies. And I remember telling Steve, and this has sort of stayed with me throughout, the Valley is not about the company. And it's not even about the idea. It's about the team. There's, there's usually a core team with a, sort of a bigger team that orbits it, like, you know, moons and asteroids that always sort of stays together. Some, they separate, they come back together and they reform around ideas. Mm. And, and, and the most important thing is, is the matrix of relationships you form and the working relationships you have. And the team is not just your architects and your salespeople and your marketers, it's your investors. I mean, you know this from venture capital, you, you hook into people and you stay with them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not just risk management. It's because there's a chemistry. I mean, venture capital is about chemistry. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things uh, you know we tell our entrepreneurs is you know you may be able to divorce your spouse, you cannot divorce your venture capitalist or your investor. So, so so choose wisely. But the other side of that coin is once you do find that affinity, that resonance, that true partnership then um, you know, no matter what your next entrepreneurial venture is, you know exactly who to go to. And, uh, and, and those same investors keep doubling down. I mean, that's, that sort of has been part of the, the playbook that has made Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, right? Is, is, is what, you're, what you're saying. Um, but, but 
In terms of the business model um, at Intertrust, for example, has that stayed pretty much steady throughout or have you experimented with um, you know, different aspects uh, all around IP, but still whether it's licensing or it's products or um, what have you, uh, just comment on that if you would. That's a great question. The, 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 the fuel mix has changed, but the model has mostly been the same. And it's funny when people always talk about IP, there's the famous t-shirt that Vince Cerf used to wear to say IP on everything. The, <laughs> he was talking about internet protocol, but you know, we, we use that term internally for intellectual property. The, uh, so in, in the beginning, until Microsoft, until our fight with Microsoft, um, we used to have this policy that we didn't license our patents. And you know, it, it, the way I explain patents and sort of the, the quick and easy way is a patent's like a recipe. Right, so you've got two choices when you have a patent. You can either sell the ready-made food based on the recipe, and you don't allow anyone to make the food. Yeah. Or you can license the recipe to people and they go home and cook it themselves. And um, you know, our, our original idea was like the Alexander Graham Bell model, which is I have the patent on the telephone, and screw you, Thomas Edison. Um, and the, but but there was a it was a very elegant approach. What we sold back then were, we had some software that we we licensed, but we sold keys, like cryptographic keys that authenticated programs and and, and people. And so this is in the 90s, by the way. Now the mm. authentication is a big deal. We were doing it way back when. Um, and the idea was that the license to the key came obviously with the full backing of the intellectual property and, um, you know, rules for good behavior. Let's call it compliance and robustness. You know, I'm not going to leave the, per, the, the the protected processing environment out on the street for people to hack. I'm going to use a certain standard of this and that. So, um, obviously, circumstances changed when we're fighting the biggest monopoly in human history since the Romans. And um, when we came out of that, we did a license with Microsoft. We'd already done a license with Sony and Phyllis before that. So, and we looked, we studied other people's models and we looked at Qualcomm, we're like, well, Qualcomm sells recipes and they sell ready-made food. Right. And given the, the breadth of what we have and given how horizontal it is, being really orthodox about one way versus the other, while we were waiting for the rest of the web and IT industry to catch up with what we invented, seemed a little too strict. Um, so we went down the Qualcomm path of, of having a licensing group and a product group, but obviously you can't boil the ocean. So the products were very strategic. So for years, our products were based on digital rights management mm. uh, for media because you know our owners were consumer electronics companies. Sony owns a studio and a record label. We're very close to the Hollywood studio, so we had a footprint there. And you know, for 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 those in India who are watching this, you know, we we protect a lot of over the top TV services in India. We protect a lot of over the top TV in China even. Um, it's been good. Now, um, you know, as I said, the, the mix of licensing product versus product product revenue is, is changing. As we grow through different markets, my expectation is that it'll be much more balanced than, than just the licensing business. The other thing I should have mentioned is we have um, a very significant investment in research and development. We have our chief scientist, uh, Bob Tarjan. Um, he's one of the most famous computer scientists in history. He's a Turing Award winner. Um, he's wow. still a professor at Princeton. Uh, Dave Mayer, who I, MJ, I think you know, is our CTO, is, aside from being one of my best friends and one of the most brilliant people I know, is, is one of the top secure systems people in the world. He ran secure systems at Bell Labs and at at and Research. He led the team that built the secure telephone unit for the national security infrastructure in the United States. Um, just a prolific inventor. In fact, we're working on some cool stuff in vaccine passports to try to solve um, the problem of you know, privacy and information fiduciaries and things like that. So we're constantly replenishing the inventive portfolio. Interesting. By the way, speaking of the, uh, the vaccine passport, I did see um, and and it's it sort of sounds obvious in hindsight, but um, I saw your post on LinkedIn where you know I think you mentioned something about you know this little white piece of paper that's that's all I have or 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 you know my wife or my my in laws have that says okay you've gotten two doses of Pfizer or Moderna on, on such and such a date 
and has a handwritten, you know, your name and, and, and so on and so forth. So A, privacy, B, security, none of that is actually built in to this very, very important piece of, of you know, paper that you may need. I'm not sure what the protocol is going to be going forward, but you'll need it as, as some sort of a proof potentially. And so the fact that there is no layer of, of this sort of security or privacy uh, embedded in any way at all was, was quite, um, you know, quite shocking, uh, even yeah, though I hadn't really thought about it too much, but, but yeah. It, it didn't hit me until I came home. I'm one of these people who obsesses about like losing documents and stuff like that. I was staring at it. I'm like, there isn't even a watermark on it. Right. Oh, I mean, for the amount of money they've spent, they could have thrown an, like an NFC chip on it or something. That, I, But but I, I don't think it was negligence. I actually think they right. thought through it and it was a deliberate move because of all of the issues with respect to the government knowing too much about you, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, the fact that I got vaccinated at XY location in Berkeley last week is often some CDC. It must be in some CDC database somewhere. Right. So, oh, right. But I mean, don't you remember as kids, we used to travel around with those yellow UN passports? The, the, the oh, yeah. Passport. oh um, yeah. I remember, it's, uh, the reason I remember that is that I just, as, as a child, I was obsessed with the color because it was like very yellow, right? And uh, I remember asking, we, we went on a family vacation to Egypt or something, and my mom was fidgeting with it. And I asked her what that was, and she was explaining it to me. But um, I was a neurotic child, but... Um, <laughs> Well, so the, the issue in the United States and in, in most democracies is, you know, who who should be trusted with that information and, you know, who can afford, you know, the story. But yeah, in India, somebody on, on LinkedIn, one of my Indian contacts said, you should really see what we're doing in India and then didn't say anything. So I haven't had time to write them and say, do tell. <laughs> but um, you have the Agar card in India, right? Of so course, of course. The social contract is different already. Um, and I, you know, Indians know how to write software. <laughs> they, uh, I'm sure they're going to come up with a pretty effective way of doing it. And of course, public health in India is extremely sophisticated. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what, what evolves in that space. Well, thank you, first of all, so much. Uh, we are absolutely honored to have you as part of the group. And, and we can go on for hours here, Talal, but, uh, but I want to be mindful of your time. You've been very, very generous. And with that, Again, I, I thank you so much for your time and, and, and for your endorsement and validation of, of what we're doing at Iron Pillar. Thanks. So, so thank really you, appreciate man. it. Take care. All the best. Take care. Bye-bye.